What is happening y'all? Cowboy here and welcome to my starter guide for Dragon's Dogma 2. Now in this guide we're going to go through everything you need to know from combat specifics to riding on an ox cart. Everything an Arisen should know before beginning their journey. And if you're wondering why you should listen to anything I have to say, well at this point I have a... Uh, you could say I have some time played. I've been busy in the world of Dragon's Dogma 2 with uh, almost 85 hours now. Uh, but either way, let's jump into it. And the first thing I want to actually talk about are some settings. Now, some of these are PC specific, but not all of them. The first thing I want to talk about is button mapping. And in particular, what I would recommend doing is swapping your vocation action to left bumper and your weapon skill to right bumper. Now, the reason for this being that all of your weapon skills are on your face buttons so x y a and b and that's also the same buttons that we would press to attack so if i'm hitting x i attack and then if i hold the bumper i'm gonna do my ability now the main reason i think with this switch makes more sense is because your vocation ability being on left bumper means the dash if you're a thief it means the block if you're playing as a fighter it means your shoulder tackle if you're playing as a warrior and so having that on left bumper personally felt a lot more natural i'm going to lower their sound i can already tell they're going to be talking over me uh but you know blocking with the right bumper is something that just didn't feel that good uh, whereas on the left bumper it did feel quite natural the other thing um over at uh where is it at game settings priority of materials combine switch this over to either pawn or player as you would like i have it on pawn and what this means is anything my pawn has picked up is going to uh by default it's gonna actually i should have put this on um anything that i'm trying to combine it's going to pull materials out of their inventories first and then on top of that, it's either going to place it into my own inventory or into item storage. I usually set out with stuff I need already. So this is, is you know, situation dependent. Uh, until you really know what you're doing, just keep it on player. And then you can move it into storage if needed. But definitely don't pass up on those. Lastly, if you're a PC player on graphics, highly, highly suggest DLSS on. I got double, sometimes triple my normal frame rate. Uh, with having this on than having it off. I'm assuming the game will get more optimized as time goes on, but at launch at least, performance was not the hottest. Moving on from the settings though, let's talk about some combat specifics. And in particular, what I wanna talk about is just some things to be aware of in combat that you should do, as well as proper choices in terms of your skills. Now in combat, obviously, for most classes, X is going to be our attack, and then Y is going to be our heavy attack. An important thing to keep in mind is pretty much every melee class, when you knock something down, you can use Y, that heavy attack, to finish them on off. So if something's on the ground, instead of doing this blade beam, it's going to flip around and stab them and finish them on off. Besides that, anytime an enemy gets knocked down, you can also use the trigger to grab them. But you can do a bunch of stuff after you grab them. You can pick them up. You can throw them into other enemies. You can throw them off cliffs. There are actually quests where it'll just be like, you know, get somebody, beat somebody that's seemingly unbeatable. Well, I'll tell you what, gravity's going to get that kill one way or another. So don't discount the ability to grab and pull larger enemies or throw smaller enemies. Now, talking about your abilities and your ability loadout. This is one that I think a lot of people are going to make a, a very early beginner mistake. In terms of your skills, I'd highly suggest you go for a split in terms of your skills. And what I mean by this is basically mobility, damage, utility, defense, stuff like that. And hear me out. There are a lot of different abilities that I could have access to as a warrior or as a mystic spear hand, which is what I'm playing with now. But if I just take damage, 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 and more damage, you know, it's going to get kind of lost in the sauce if everything's damaged. So taking Mystic Spearham, for example, I have Dragon's Fin. This is an engagement move. It's also great for mobility. If, you know, I'm like, oh, how do I cross this area? I want to get onto a roof. Well, well guess what? That's going to get me onto a roof. And not every class has mobility like that. But having a engagement move is super useful. Moving on from that, I have my nuke. Or excuse me, that was Dragon's Fin. This one's Wild Fury. Wild Fury is just here to nuke. The whole point is I have knocked something down. I've staggered it. I am trying to take it on out. That's where that ability is going to come in. Moving on from there, I have Sky Dragon's Feast. This is considered my evasive or my counter. That can counter stuff and then hit it. It also has a little bit of mobility by getting me on top of stuff. And then lastly, 
I have Ravenous Hand, which when I hit stuff with that, it will vacuum their stamina out and give it back to me. Now you might think like, well, I can just run around and get my stamina back. But if I knock something down and I'm trying to nuke, I could go through a full Wild Fury combo and you can see how much stamina that's using up. And then use that and immediately get all of that stamina back. And that is the advantage of, of this, you know, going to this guy, boom, 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 full stamina. And I can immediately go into my combo again to nuke something. And so the point I'm making here is if you just go for four different flavors of damage, you're going to end up missing out on the true potential of your class. I think a good example of this is Warrior. The Warrior actually has one move that it has like two different moves that are aerial oriented that do damage. And while you could use either of them, one of the big advantages is one of those moves is very significant in its knockdown potential. And at the end of the day, I ended up prioritizing that move because I could use it to knock down an enemy, get them on the ground, and then open them up to more damage opportunities. Even though I liked the uppercut more because it had less stamina cost, the strength of the knockdown was just too strong to not consider using that as my main ability. And I am going to fall because I'm running in places where I shouldn't be. Uh, moving on from combat specifics, the next thing I want to talk about is going to be vocations. Just let me get up a little bit and then we'll just fast travel on out of here. Oh, it's because we're in combat. No, I should, I should be able to use this in combat. Let's see. As long as it doesn't bring them. Nope, it's not going to let me. Well, we're going to just run into town. Uh, so talking a little bit about vocations, there are a bunch of different vocations in the game. And one of the big, big changes that this game has over the first game is our stats are no longer tied to our vocation. And what I mean by this is if you are playing the game as a warrior, for example, and you decide, hey, you know what? I don't think I want to be a warrior anymore. I think I want to do magic. You can now just freely change to mage and not worry about it. And the reason I'm pointing this out is in the previous game, if you were leveling as a warrior and then you decided you suddenly wanted to be a sorcerer, your damage wasn't going to be all that hot because all of the leveling you had done had put your stats into strength. And the point is, this is no longer the case. So uh, the two things to, to look out for here, while we're in town, I can also talk about this. Uh, let's talk signs. That means vocations guild. That sign is the inn. And then over there, we can see the signs for the armory as well as the weaponry. But so going on over to the vocations, once you have unlocked them, which causes discipline, uh, you get discipline every time you kill a monster, you can just freely swap between your vocations. Nothing is lost. It's not like you, you lose experience. And the only thing you need to keep in mind is going to be, do you have the gear to use that vocation? In terms of unlocking all the vocations, I have a, a whole separate guide on how to unlock these and how to get the master skills. That's also in the playlist. Uh, but the big point I want to make is don't be afraid to change between vocations. You know, fighter starts off very slow. If you pick fighter and you're not really vibing with it, swap to an archer, swap to a mage, swap to a thief, try something else and have fun. At the same time, talking about augments, these are passives that can be shared between vocations. Now you can only have a set number on, but right now I'm playing as a mystic spear hand. You can see I have a spear hand one. I have a warrior one, I have two magic archer, and then I have two from warfare. So even if you're playing a class that you don't think you're going to enjoy it all that, all that much, a big consideration is what augments does it have? Because let's say I want to play a beefy boy. All I want to do is warrior. I want to smash. Well, if I level up thief all the way, I get a strength augment and I like more strength. So keep in mind the augments that each class has. That is a, a very important consideration as you're playing. Core skills I wouldn't worry about. You just pick them up as you get them. That just dynamically increases what your class is capable of outside of your augments and weapon skills. And the same rules also apply for your pawn. You know, a good example, which I see almost nobody doing, is, you know, I have a mage pawn. This is mostly about support and keeping stuff alive. But if I go over to my augments, you know, this comes from the sorcerer and it's going to augment my magic. This one is from rogue, but decreasing the likelihood of being targeted. That's great for a backline healer. Yet I don't see any mages using it. And that one's really, really easy to get too. I think I had to go, I, I got rank four, but I think I had to go to like two and thief to pick up subtlety. So uh, don't sleep on switching vocations around. There's no downside to swapping. Would highly recommend it. 
Moving on from vocations though, as I mentioned, if you're going to be doing vocations, you need to have gear. Now, by far the easiest way to get gear in the game is just going to be going over to the person, going over to a smith, going to buy, and buying a weapon. And even something that's cheaper, like the iron sword at, you know, just, just to show, show a, a comparison here, uh, 432 is what that thing hits. This is a fraction of the cost, right? So if I purchase that and I go to enhance, your first enhancement is only going to cost gold. Your subsequent ones are going to cost materials. But even then, this is now up to 432 compared to how much was this? 432. So buy, buying something that was a fraction of the cost and just putting upgrades into it, put it on par with something that's roughly three times the price. Uh, but so buying up new weapons and new gear at blacksmithing is going to by easy by, by far be the easiest way to acquire new gear. You can find gear out in the world, but keep in mind you're exploring, you open a chest, it might be a weapon or a piece of armor not for the vocation you're using. So don't be shy about buying gear. And in particular, don't be shy about enhancing. Enhancing is absolutely huge in this game. For weapons, it's gonna make them stronger. For the gear you wear, it's gonna increase the defense as well as make it lighter. Uh, in terms of finding gear in the wild, if I can get up high enough, I'll point it on out, but there's basically two chests to keep your eye out for in the game. Mildred, we're not doing this right now. Why do you gotta interrupt me? Anyway, point is there are two different types of chests in the game. We have general loot chests and we have equipment chests. And the reason I want to point this out is because not every chest in the game is going to have, have gear in it. So right here, this type of chest, this is just going to be a loot chest. Uh, it's going to have a consumable, it's going to have arrows, it's going to have something that can heal you, but it's not going to have gear. Over there, there's another chest you can see over there. That's also just gonna have some equipment in it. Now, gear chests generally are going to be like a black steel looking chest, and it's gonna have kind of a gold ring on top of it. It looks a little bit more ornate, but if you see those chests, those chests most likely have gear for either your vocation or another vocation. So keep your eyes out for them. And while you can buy really good gear at shops, I will say there is some crazy gear that can only be found out in the world. I don't want to go too spoilery as this is the starter guide, but I'll I'll show y'all one piece. I'll show y'all one one piece of uh, cool gear that you can only find out in the world that I like. Let's see, let's go, uh, uh, where is she? There we go, Cinder Spine. So this is like a giant permanently on fire mace with 150% fire damage. That's found out in the world, can't buy it in any shop thing absolutely slaps it is incredibly strong but so obviously explore and look for gear but at the same time do not be afraid to use the shops to buy upgrades because when you get to new regions when you find new areas chances are they're probably selling something that's going to be better than what you have you. moving on from gear the next thing i want to talk about is pawns the most unique part of dragon's dogma and something that is very unique it's very awesome. I'm a huge fan of the pawn system. But so right now we're at a rift stone, and this is going to be where you summon pawns. Throughout the world, you're going to find some unique rift stones, which we can then revisit. It could have pawns that are big, pawns with a distinct upper half, uh, pawns that are kind hearted, pawns that are simple, whatever the case is, if you want to resummon those from rift stones you found in the wild. But there's a couple things I want to talk about while we are in the rift stone. So when you're first here and you're looking around, it might be like, oh man, there's there's so many pawns, you know, there's they're all over the place. How do I find one that has what I want? We go here, we go to pawns and rift, and then we tab over to weapon skill. Now a good example here is I like thieves that have a uh, skull splitter. So I can see no skull splitter, no skull splitter, scrolling down, and there's none. So all I'm gonna do is I just leave the rift, and then I'm going to jump back in. Now, occasionally you'll see duplicate pawns, but for the most part, when you do this, it is going to refresh the choices of pawns that are available. And look, there we go. There's one that has skull splitter. So I'm going to add a marker to Donovan. You do not, you do not. All right, we can back out and there we go. He's already got a check mark on him so I can run right over and I can look more in depth at his details. Now, some other things to be aware of with pawns. First up, what is their trait? 
Uh, simple is great for a class like this. Simple or straightforward is usually what I want on a uh, a DPS type class because simple is gonna you know if we're just hanging out and I'm looking around and they see loot they're gonna grab it. So simple is great. Straightforward they're gonna focus on attacking. That's great. Uh, for example, with my my own pawn who is a a, a healer focused, I'm going to I have her set up as uh, kind hearted. Which if we scroll down. We can see prioritizes support and is quick to aid allies. That's basically what you want on a mage. That's ideal. Obviously, we're playing on my alt account right now. That's why it says brawling horseman. But uh, you know, point is, there's there's a couple different things you can look at and be aware of with pawns. I wouldn't worry that much about specialization. Sometimes these are useful. Sometimes not so much. Looking at pawn badges, these are useful in the sense that it means that pawn has killed enough of that target that it knows how to fight it and knows what to use to its advantage. So this pawn knows immediately. It sees a golem, it knows the target, the weak spots, it knows you know when to get the damage in. Fighting a griffin, it knows that griffins are gonna be weak to fire and when it's grounded, you wanna go for the face. Uh, so pawn badges are just a good idea of like, oh, how much knowledge does this pawn have? How effective will it be in combat? Also over at vocations, the biggest things to consider are what are the weapon skills? And if you're looking at pawns that other players have, you should also look at the augments. Because if there's two pawns that have equal skills, but one of them has like one augment on it, that tells me that they have a lazy arisen who is not setting up their pawns to their maximum potential. So keep in mind the stuff that pawns have when making your choice about what you want to summon. Uh, talking a little bit more about pawns and some things to utilize with them, Always share the load with pawns. And we're talking about how much weight you have. Uh, I think a lot of people were, were kind of curious about this and were a little bit shy. But so with your pawns, anything that you have in their inventory is is still there. So for example, I'll, I'll put this on him. That's still mine. Now, if I, if I go to uh, the pants, if I give those, and then I go over to Jin, and I go to equip. I'll get this. If you change the pawn's equipment, the previously equipped item is returned to the master. The only time you would want to do this, let's say your buddy starts playing the game and he's like, I need some help. I'm struggling. I'll rent out his pawn. I'll put some dope gear on it and then I'll send it back to him. That is when I would use that feature. But this stuff just sitting here in the pawn's inventory, the pawn's just holding shit for me. And it's important to note that that loot is not lost. So if I take that that Jin here, if I take him if your pack grows over full, and I dismiss, not giving a gift because this is a Capcom pawn, it's basically just AI. I'll give gifts when I have player pawns. But So I gave him away and he had that sword on him. If I go back over here to an well, inn in my chest. Forget the fatigue of a long journey when treat there it is, the Iron Sword. So the point being that if you're playing and your weight is getting up, if you're getting into the heavy, the very heavy, over-encumbered, make the pawns carry the load. Have them share the burden. There is no point to not have the pawns carry items for you. Moving on from there, let's talk about travel. Now, there are three main ways to travel in this game. Your own two feet, ox carts, and fairy stones. Now, most of the time you're going to be running, but if you want to go to regions, ox carts are a decent way. Now, I wouldn't just suggest climbing on one that's sitting because half the time it won't work right. What you should do is use the await ox cart function. That is going to fast forward time to where the ox cart is like getting ready to depart. Sometimes I'll notice one just sitting in town and I'll hop on it and the guy just looks at me like I'm an asshole and he won't, he won't take off. Uh, but if I use that to call it in, I can then sit. And then he will come up and he will ask me for the fare. I can give him the fare. And then if I wait just a second, I'll be able to doze off. And that essentially makes it more of a fast travel. Now, obviously, you can stay awake the whole time if you want. But, you know, that's that's not for everybody. I'm going to be dozing off and saving some time. Now, if the ox cart gets attacked. Let's see. Fingers crossed. Yes. If we get attacked while traveling. All you got to do is kill all the attackers there's that unique heavy attack I was talking about earlier in the video and you'll know when they're dead because the hear how the music ended and now all you want to do is just hop back on 
sit down and doze off again. And then we're going to wake up at our destination. Uh, if you are playing as a warrior, I would not suggest fighting next to the cart. Warrior attacks, I mean any, any Arisen's attack, but warrior attacks, charge attacks can, can actually shatter the cart. Or even worse, you could kill the ox. And at that point, you, your ride is over. No refunds. Uh, now, as for the other means of travel, our fairy stones, these are a bit more rare. Now, once you get towards the post game, they become quite plentiful. But early on, these things are like golden geese. You're not going to have a lot of them. And you should use them very sparingly, not like I am right now. Uh, but they can travel to port crystals, which are permanent establishments, or mobile port crystals, which you have set down yourself. Now, just to, to show a port crystal, we're going to warp on over to one and grab it. And in your first playthrough, you should expect to find maybe five of these. Maybe. I'm still trying to track down all the port crystal locations. Uh, but the idea behind a port crystal, the portable one, is you just pick somewhere, you drop it, and now it's just going to stay here, and I have created a fast travel point, assuming I have a fairy stone. Sure, you can come in. Uh, some other stuff, gold from quest, RC is only used in the rift. You can occasionally get that from enemies. Uh, but RC is mainly going to come from other people using your pawn. I wouldn't really worry about it. You only spend RC on like cosmetic changes or uh, renting out pawns that are a higher level than your own. So the last thing I want to talk about in this video is going to be exploration and pawn commands. So you can see in the bottom left, we have go, help, wait, and to me. These are quite simple. They, they do exactly what they're said. Uh, if we go on over into the tutorial logbook, it'll actually break down, you know, direct pawns with go, answer pawn suggestions with go. Um, and those are, are things that will happen in the game, which I don't I remember if I talked about it. But uh, yeah, definitely the tutorial logbook. This is super good. Anything that you may have forgotten, utilize it. You know, stuff like people, people that are dead that you can bring back to life using wake stones. Uh, the NPC logbook, if you're trying to find somebody in particular, it'll tell you what their residence in and as well as what they like if you're trying to increase the relationship with them. But as we are exploring, if I come across an area I haven't been, my pawn might be like, you know, hey, I know of a treasure chest that's around here, or hey, I know of a dungeon that's around here. And at that point, if I hit go, it will have them then go after that and guide me on over to it. So, just like this. She's pointing. Give it a second. I'm going to tell her to go. We got that little exclamation point. And now Cicero is going to take me on over to a cave that I have not gotten before. So I'm guessing it's right here. So we can go on in there. Hopefully it's a it's a quick and dirty. I don't want a, a big cave right now. But it would be good to, to explore a cave. Uh, so as we're exploring, obviously, lanterns always on in caves. And... When you go into caves, you will slowly get the whole map covered of the cave, and that's going to be your, your way of knowing, like, hey, this place is done. So when I explore, I'll, I'll literally, like, run into all the crevices just to cover the map and make sure I'm getting everything. While I'm in caves, I'll also use the go command that'll send them to to kind of go out and find any loot they can within the cave. Don't be afraid to use some rocks, throw some rocks at people if you have, have the opportunity to. And look at that. There we go. So this is an example of a gear chest. So gold, it's gilded. And we got some Bardiche daggers out of it. And then by comparison, here we have this is just a regular loot chest. So opening that up, I got some gold. There we go. Just a quick little dirty cave. Not all caves are this short. Some of them are are quite lengthy. Uh, but that was actually the, the perfect cave for the, uh, the tutorial video. Um, but yeah, that, that is going to be the, the main thing for, for exploration. 
Um, as you're exploring, oh, one thing I didn't touch on, which I definitely want to before I close out, is health. So as you can see, I'm actually missing a chunk of my health right now. And we're going to call that call that fatigue. I remember there's a specific term for it, but I always forget it. But we'll just call that fatigue. Uh, that is health that I won't get back until I rest. And when I say rest, I mean no either by using a campsite or by resting at an inn. Uh, to use a campsite, you're going to have to make camp with a pattern kit. These weigh quite a lot. So in general, if I'm adventuring, I'll have two on me and my pawn's going to carry them because they take up weight. But you can also go to these camps and equip skills. So if I'm going around and I'm like, you know what? Sky Dragon's Feast isn't really working out for me. I, I think I want to put put something else on. Maybe maybe Magic Spirogi or Onto Heaven. I can just go here, swap that on out. And now I have a new skill. So definitely don't discount these little campfires. They're useful. Uh, some other stuff, that little icon you see on the map right now, that just indicates a spot where there are a bunch of gatherable materials. So the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, there must be, you know, ore or something here. And it just means like, hey, there's, there's, you know, you can see they're over there gathering stuff. They just created a, a fruit robe around. But that just indicates, hey, there's a spot here on the map that stuff can be gathered. So don't don't worry too much about it. Uh, you'll also see like chest icons that'll pop up on the map that indicates there was a chest there. It may be a chest that you had already looted. It doesn't mean there is an active chest, uh, but just, just stuff to be aware of. So uh, either way, with all that being said, I think we are finally at the point where I want to wrap off and to say goodbye, we will yeet this goblin away. Yeet! With that, I'll send y'all on your way just like that goblin. Thanks for coming on by. I'll catch you next time.